we we do look uh, like uh, was it a murder of crows? <laughs> 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 You know, and just after Shuso mentioned crows this morning, I was remembering uh, I was able to spend a year living in Chennai in South India. And in Chennai is a city that's just full of crows, um, hundreds and thousands, probably more, millions of crows. And people spend times on their, time on their roofs, and you see these flocks of hundreds of crows on each roof. And um, part of it's because people feed the crows, they give them offerings before each meal. Um, and the crows are sort of beloved in Chennai. They, uh, you know, they clean up when the, the, a rat dies in the street, it's the crows that take care of it. So there's um, this, this kind of uh, beautiful interaction between humans and crows in Chennai. And so we're kind of, uh, <laughs> reminds me of that. <laughs> Nothing to do with the rats. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, good morning. <laughs> My name is Fugan. Um, I'm also from Massachusetts, part of that uh, contingent of Village Zendo out there, and I'm out on the Cape. Uh, so I'm part of the Cape Cod Sangha that Joan was speaking about the other day. Uh, I, li I live here. <laughs> 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 not, not quite as picture as, <laughs> as here. <laughs> it's great. And, and we do have a zendo out there. And um, although none of our practitioners besides me are here right now, others will be coming and uh, you're all invited to come practice with us. We do uh, Zazen Kai once a month and it's wonderful when the sanghas come together out there. So uh, consider yourselves invited. Um, and so it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today, uh, especially because living in a distance, I don't always get to sit face to face with my teachers and my Dharma brothers and sisters. Um, and it's especially fun to be practicing with people I'm just meeting for the first time. It's always really special, that connection that we make in this silence. And so, when we're on retreat together, it's really our intensive individual efforts that we, that we see the most of. But these efforts are done in a group. Um, as we were bowing uh, just before we started this talk, you know, we're, we're bowing as one, we're sitting as one, we're eating as one. And it's, it's this intensive individual effort that creates this session, this experience. We all understand that, but it's, it's a group practice as much as it is on our cushion. It's about relationship, oddly enough, even though we don't talk to each other. And so I apologize for being absent yesterday uh, from sitting. I was sick, and that was, uh, that was my practice yesterday, just being sick. And um, I'm grateful for all of you guys taking care of me. Um, you know, some of you coming out and checking in on me, bringing me food, um, really taking care of physically, but also by continuing the practice in here really uh, nourished me and, and made me feel like it's okay for me to spend the day in bed because I know everything here is happening as it should. Everyone's taking care together. So I, it's not easy uh, to get away from our busy lives. Uh, from our responsibilities to participate in this kind of uh, residential training, this intensive residential training that we've all committed to. And so while I'm here this summer, I'm trying to keep in mind the efforts of so many people that made this possible for me to be here. Um, it had something to do with me and my intention, but more to do with a lot of other people contributing to making this possible. And I'm sure you all feel the same way. And as the monitor, um, I'm able to kind of watch what's happening. And the overriding sense I get is that uh, everyone is keenly aware of, of that larger Sangha community supporting us, our families, our um, partners, and, and colleagues, co-workers. You know, it takes um, takes a lot to make this possible and 
uh, from the perspective in the monitor's chair, it just seems like the sincerity of the practice is, is, is really there this time. And that's not to compare it to other retreats, but it's, it's there this time. Um, and there's, there doesn't seem to be any pretense. Uh, it feels like it's originating from our hearts. It's beautiful. And, and I also feel like there's some ease and joy that's settled in. And, you know, part of it is surely the change in the weather. Um, you know, I think uh, it might have been Shinryu, but someone once uh, told us that uh, uh, part of samadhi or samadhi is, is primarily dependent on barometric pressure. <laughs> I'm not sure I have that quite right, but for me, anyhow, the... The weather has something to do with it. And, and personally, not being uh, in bed with all the symptoms definitely makes it feel like it's more joyful. Um, so he here we are again in another ango, surrounded by these beautiful woods, the rolling hills, and the mountains uh, in this river, river valley. And the Hudson River it flows right down the hill, about a little more than a half mile away over there. And we're in this rickety old house that we turn into a temple every summer, and we practice the ancient Buddha way together. And while this house has always been at 119 Duncan Avenue, and Storm King Mountain is still kind of over there to our southeast, and the stairs are still creaking like they have. Um, nothing is the same as last year or the year before. You know, the forests are really different. You know, if you take a close look, and the building is different, the grounds are different, and even the sounds of the floorboards are not the same as last year. The Hudson River is flowing in its banks, but the water in there right now is different than it was an hour ago. Its shape, composition, its texture, the motion. Right now, the Hudson is unique to this moment. And that's already gone. And this is true for us, just like the river. We're not the same as when we first came to retreat with Village Zendo uh, at Cornwall and Hudson. And we're not the same as we were when we arrived this time for Sashin. And even since the talk began, we've flowed, we've changed. Likewise, the Genjo Koan that we're studying is not the same one we studied when Joan was Shuso. <laughs> the readers and the experience and the setting and the world have shifted dramatically in some ways. As our Shuso said this morning uh, so eloquently during our work, Samu, today is not yesterday. So this is something we all know. Uh, everything is changing. Impermanence is the name of the game. But we nevertheless cling to our ideas of how things are. And it's often really subtle. I know how you are and you are because we've sat together for decades in, in some cases. I know how I am, because I've sat with me for <laughs> longer than that. <laughs> you know, and, and I have some ideas of how things should be. And these things are, are sticky, and they're rooted in our consciousnesses. And oftentimes, uh, when we're not aware of it, that gets in the way of us seeing how things are, seeing who people are, and seeing who we are. And it gets in the way of our listening closely to the world. And it really gets in the way of our action, muddying the water, making our actions uh, ineffective, unskillful. <coughs> Yesterday, I caught a glimpse of the ridge, uh, Storm King Ridge over there. And even after all these years of seeing it, um, it was new. And, and there was this moment of openness when I saw it. And in that instance, you know, before I made up the story of this wonderful moment of seeing Storm King Ridge <laughs> and, and you know, thinking, oh, that'll be great for my Dharma talk. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there was simply this moment of 
mountain viewing, right? Or just viewing, or just this, uh, or you know, just go take a look at it, really, and, and you'll know what I mean because I can't say it. It's new each time we look, just like the sunrise is new, uh, each period of zazen is new, each sound of the bell is new. It's always so, but it takes our sincere efforts, uh, like we've been giving it this retreat, to really be here and truly experience the unfolding of this session. And of course, the unfolding of our lives, which is not any different. So in the Genjo Koan, Dogen teaches us, if you examine myriad things with a confused body and mind, you might suppose that your mind and nature are permanent. When you practice intimately and return to where you are, it will be clear that nothing at all has unchanging self. Fresh and new, the stifling heat of those first days, then the rain, and now this coolness today, a breeze on your neck or a pain in your back. And it's all new. You may think this is the same pain I've had for the last three periods of Zazen, but it's not, it's new. It's fresh, it's brand new right now. And when you look at it closely, you can see that it's a sensation and it's not the sensation we thought it was. It's a new sensation in your body, and it's changing, it's in flux, it's flowing. And this is our lives. Suzuki Roshi famously said, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert's mind there are few. Mary Oliver, the poet who also lived in P-Town for a time wrote, the man who has many answers is often found in the theaters of information where he offers, graciously, his deep findings. Well, the man who has only questions to comfort himself makes music. So this year I've been especially struck by the sounds happening at the Grail. They are endless and show up in stark relief without the normal din of our phones and radios and conversations. The birds and insects on their own are a universe of sound. Like Shuso this morning, I was really moved by the soundscape, you know, the cooing morning doves, morning doves, then the woodpecker, <laughs> yeah, and then the dog barking. I mean, it, was, it was really uh, a whole world of sound. And if we add in the creaky stairs and the breathing of your neighbor and the internal sounds going on in you, um, it's endless when we can listen to it. And each sound provides a direct route into each moment and into the flow of this retreat. In fact, the 10,000 sounds are the flow of the retreat. Bells, clackers, and drums mark the timing of the chanting, our zazen, our movements throughout the temple spaces, our sleeping and waking as well. So ideally, when you're on retreat, you don't have to keep a watch. You, don't, you know the time through the sounds that are around us. And in fact, if you look more closely, you even know where certain people are because of the sounds, when people are entering, coming from the teacher's cabin. All these things are um, intimately linked to the sonic spaces of our retreat. Recently, I've been uh, reading about music in deaf culture uh, as a part of a project Ocean Hoshi and I are working on together. The first thing I learned is that there is something called deaf music. And I knew there were a lot of talented deaf musicians, and Ocean is one. If you get the chance to hear him play, you should. Um, but I didn't know that deaf culture, like every other culture in the world, has its own indigenous music. 
Henry Wadsworth Longfellow uh, said that music is the universal language of human of mankind of humankind we can say and there's there's some truth to that you know like that music is played in every culture but like language uh, music is often unintelligible across cultures and so we have to think a little bit about what music is to really find the the truth in that statement of of Longfellow's Wadsworth um, and I like uh, a definition given by um, a musician and scholar named John Blacking back in the 60s uh, he said he called music humanly organized sound. And, and the organization of music can, of sound, to create music can be by a musician, can be a composer. But I also think we can recognize that our listening organizes the sound into music. The bird songs, when we hear them, they may become music for us. And there's mounting evidence that birds themselves use their, their sounds as music, that they communicate some meaning through sound, like we do music. But f for us to um, understand sound, it has to be humanly organized. And the human part is key here. It's embodiment of sound. And so how we organize it depends on us being present because we are only embodying our lives when we're present to them. It's how we organize ourselves as sound. So deaf music relies on visual rhythm, communal musicking, music making, and tactile encounters with sound. And so doing this research, I've uncovered a lot of biases and misconceptions in my own views of deaf culture, first of all, um, and my attachments to ideas of sound, hearing, and communication. In deaf culture, movement, touch, and kinesthetic awareness often replaces the ear as the vehicle for interpreting sound. By shifting our perspectives, as hearing people to include these other senses, we can begin to weaken habitual ways of understanding the world. Our incorporation of sign language in the chanting of the four vows here, which is the project Ocean and I are looking at, gives us a chance to experience some of this perspective shift that I'm talking about. The uh, Buddhist music scholar P.N. Chen wrote, There is no music behind the movement of music. It is itself a movement. If we remove the movement, there is no such thing as music. I'm just going to repeat that because it's a little um, Dogen-esque. <laughs> <laughs> there is no music behind the movement of music. It is itself a movement. If we remove the movement, there is no such thing as music. And I think we can substitute ourselves for music, and the meaning is still the same. We can say there is no me behind the movement of me. I am myself movement. If we remove the movement, there is no such thing as me. So we, we start our days here with the wake-up bell. And I don't know if you've all seen the movement of the wake-up bell being run in, rung in the dimness of the morning here at the Grail. That visual rhythm is itself a powerful expression. You can feel the subtle flow needed to get the striker moving just right inside that bell. It reminds me of fish jumping out of the water. They don't sound the same to our ears, but there's a connection. And the pattern played on the Han, uh, this is the big, what we call the big wood block, 
struck before each of the times we come for meditation. This is, to me, a visual pattern. It's already very visual. Um, there's the, the four hits in the introduction at the top, and we have seven slow hits, five faster hits, three faster hits, a roll down, bock, and that's the first round. And this shape that how I interpret it, um, is closely related to um, the way Indian musicians think of musical time. Uh, this visual representation would be called uh, gopuchayati, which means cow's tail shape, uh, because it you know the end of a cow's tail. There's a river mouth shape. Um, th there's a number of different ones there. And so the first round ends with this one hit, Bach. The second round, it's a little smaller, ends with two hits, Bach, Bach. And the smaller third round ends with the three hits. Yeah, and so we've created this visual tapestry through sound. It's hanging in space. And that same shape rhythmic shape. Um, we hear it throughout the day in different forms, in the tenzo bell, interspersed between the instruments and liturgy. Um, I have a feeling there's uh, a, a history to that, that that we can someday explore, um, that trans transmission of, of rhythmic shapes through Buddhist musical sounds. So the Han out here is a beautiful instrument, and I, I hope you take a look at it. Um, and while you're here, take the chance to learn this pattern because it's a beautiful pattern to play. And when you watch our Jikido's uh, performing it, it really is a song of stillness and motion. The big spaces be we hear between these first seven hits, you know, already it's spatial, it's visual, it's sonic. Um, these are, are stillness to me between the dramatic action of the Bach. The performance of the Han relies on the Jikido showing up and playing it at the right time. And it relies on us seeing it or hearing it. And it's fully embodied sound taking place at a fully embodied moment. Each strike conveys the beauty of the sound movement in the very instant it's heard or seen. In that instance of fully embodying our hearing, seeing of the Han, we are time itself. And Dogen, put, Dogen puts it this way in his fascicle uh, on time, Uji. Time is not separate from you as you are present, time does not go away. Dogen advises us, see each thing in this entire world as a moment of time. Things do not hinder one another, just as moments do not hinder one another. The way-seeking mind arises in this moment. A way-seeking moment arises in this mind. In the Genjo Koan, Dogen, Dogen describes it using the analogy of firewood and ash. Each abides in its own time. If we only see ash as a result of burning the wood, we let the firewood hinder ash, and we miss the truth of that ash. Ash is a moment in time, complete. It's a moment of time, even. It contains its own past and present, but it's not overwhelmed by them. Hearing the Bach of the Han, we're similarly abiding in the time of its production. If we only understand it as a sign to arrive at the Zendo, we miss it. Even if we just fall into naming and classifying it as the Han pattern, we also miss it. We are the time being of each stroke of the Han. Bach. 
And while each instant of sound can only be experienced as it's produced in that moment, we also experience the whole of the Han call. The introduction flows into the first round, flows into the second round, and flows into the third. Fuck. 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 And when the Han sounds, we head into the Zendo for Zazen. When the bell rings, we bow. When we're chanting, we follow the Mukugyo. These sounds and their functions are not separate from the flow within them. And they flow within us when we are attentive to them. If we remove the flow, there's no us, there's no sounds, and there's no music in this session. So this, this period of time, these 10 days, um, I'm especially grateful to be away from the incessant clamor, uh, filling the airwaves and filling my mind. With all the blaring and mostly inane talk, uh, I've been finding it hard to hear what's going on, hear what's going on in, in me and really around me. At this point in the retreat, for me, that resonance has faded somewhat. Its grip has relaxed, and I can feel uh, some ease just in that. In the Shuso's commitment form, she suggests we practice listening deeply during Ango. This listening means deeply being in the world. And while it's always imperative, uh, the assault on the truth in our current climate uh, puts our practice into a sharper light. We see it, um, or when we see the world as it is, we're able to let go of our ideas of how it should be. And in this seeing and hearing, we're not separate. In our zazen, we penetrate the impermanent and empty nature of the 10,000 things and encounter a space of connection. And from there, we step forward, uh, we show up, and we can act. Uh, Korean Zen master Sung San said it this way, everything as it is, is the truth. How do you use this truth to make a correct life? Moment to moment, you must per perceive your correct situation, correct, correct relationship, and correct function. <coughs> So the, the type of listening the Shuso suggests we do is transformation itself. Uh, Jise quoted Dogen in her commitment form. When you see forms or hear sounds fully engaging body and mind, you intuit Dharma intimately. Fully engaging our bodies and minds requires the kind of presence we're developing here with our hard work on the cushions, our hard work in Samu, and in all the practices we do together. And in this perspective, we still have the internal stories that are going on always, the emotions, the fear, the anger, uh, but they don't pull us along like they otherwise might. Intuiting the Dharma intimately, we can hear the very real issues in the world, and we can see more clearly what is being done and what we need to do. This is how we manifest Avalokiteshvara, the bodhisattva of great compassion that Roshi described during her opening talk. This is also known as Kuan Yin, with the thousand arms and hands holding tools. And this motion that Roshi suggested seeing in, in the um, image she has is the motion of appropriate action that we take to alleviate the suffering that we encounter when we manifest Kuan Yin. When I think of Avalokiteshvara, hearing the cries of the world, I actually often think of this robe, and I, I don't know if I told you guys the story of this, but I'm just gonna briefly let you know. Um, parts of this, this robe, you can, if you can see it in the right light, there's a pattern in there, and uh, the cloth um, that I use 
the cloth with this pattern, um, some of it which I shared with Ocean, so it's also in his robe, came from uh, as a gift to me as I was leaving Sierra Leone in 1992. Um, I had been down there uh, for over there for about a year, and and at that point. Um, the country was just erupting into civil war that would go on for 11 years. Um, and a, a, as you probably remember, this was a brutal time uh, in their history. Uh, you can't imagine uh, uh, the horrors that went on. Um, and this, this particular cloth was given to me by a friend in the village where I lived. And he was holding on to it because it's, it's a special cloth made from special fabric and dyed with um, kola nuts in, in a particular pattern that's, um, if it's made into the correct garment by the correct person, in this case the blacksmith, it becomes a bulletproof shirt. And these, these shirts were mostly uh, designed to protect you from magic bullets. Um, but when the war started, of course, uh, all kinds of magic implements were incorporated uh, into the efforts. Um, the ch child soldiers especially were, were given magic, uh, not necessarily these shirts, but magic uh, implements to protect them and then pushed off into war, drugged up, um, uh, forced to endure the uh, unimaginable horrors so they would be um, more dangerous on the battlefield. And so, when I put on this robe, um, that's present as well. Um, I can, in, in a small way, uh, hear and, and uh, perceive that part of the world, that terror. Um, John mentioned that when we uh, chant, uh, vast is the robe of liberation, and put on our kesa in the morning, our robes, we're all putting on the robes of the Buddha. And in the Buddha's robe, everything's included. You know, the suffering of this faraway war and the suffering that's happening uh, right now in, in our world. Uh, we're not separate from it, even a little. Genjo Koan is Dogen's teaching on fully entering in this moment, right here, now, where we are. Uh, it applies to Session and also applies to our life outside of session, to our jobs, in our families, in our communities. And we're at this point deep in the heart of our session. As Shuso said the first night, there's really only two things we need to do. Maintain the silence and follow the schedule. With internal silence, we can go deep into the practice of each moment. And this quality of silence is openness, and it depends on each of us committing to it. And following the schedule supports us on the way, but the schedule is really just us showing up together and doing this work. Each of us is integral. Each moment of silence and moment of sound is really just us. So I'll end with a poem by the lovely monk, Ryo Khan. Children, let's go to the mountain to view violets. If they scatter away tomorrow, what can we do? Children, let's go to the mountain to view violets. If they scatter away tomorrow, what can we do? So please enjoy your silence, listening deeply, and make each moment of this retreat really your music.